All right, hello guys, let's get started. Is my mic on back there? Now, better? How about now? There we go. All right, we're all set. Adjust this a little bit. Okay, so last time we started talking about uh, deciding whether two propositions uh, were in fact the same proposition, just written in different ways. And we called this the idea of two, pro uh, the idea of two propositions being uh, logically equivalent. Uh, and we learned one way to decide if they were, uh, and that was to look at the truth table uh, of the propositions. So you do a truth table for each proposition, you look at the last column of the truth table, and if they're the same, then the propositions are logically equivalent, uh, and you're happy. Uh, and we did an example like that uh, based on that infrared scanner uh, translation question we had already done. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and do another example. Uh, this one is to decide if the following two propositions are equivalent. So the negation of P or Q and the negation of P and the negation of Q. And of course that's bracketed like this, right? Because negation is the one exception. It binds very tightly and other than that I put in parentheses. So I want to check if these two things uh, are logically equivalent. Okay, and the way we do that is we make a truth table for each one of them. So I have two variables. I have P and Q. So P can be true or false. And Q can be true or false, as usual. Okay, now I do a truth table for each one of these things. But to save space, I really just do one truth table with uh, a bunch of columns in it. So what am I going to need? I'm going to need... P or Q, and then I'm going to want the full first expression, which is not P or Q. So this column here, the second column, is very important. And then for the other one, the other expression, I will need not P, not Q, and not P and not Q. Okay, and the columns that I'm interested in are this column and this column. So are they the same? If they are, then the two propositions are logically equivalent. If they're not the same, uh, then the propositions are not logically equivalent. All right, so let's first figure out what P or Q is. We know how to do that. It's true, 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 false. Right? P or Q is only false when both P and Q are false. So the negation of that is just going to be false, 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 true. So far, so good? All right. So now we need not P, uh, and that's easy. That's just false, false, true, true. We just negate this first column over here. And for not Q, it's just the negation of the second column here. So that's false, true, false, true. And now we take the conjunction of these two columns here uh, to give us false, 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 true. So now we look at these columns, false, 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 true, false, 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 true, and they're exactly the same. So that means that the negation of P or Q is exactly the same as the conjunction of the negations. So the negation of the disjunction is the conjunction of the negations, if you want to remember it that way. All right, so these two things are equal. These two columns are exactly the same, therefore they're logically equivalent. This thing here happens to be called de Morgan's Law. So sometimes logical equivalences have special names. This is one of those times. This, uh, uh, this logical equivalence is, well, it, it's one of de Morgan's Laws, I should say. All right, so does this make sense as a method? Yeah? Can you just repeat the negation of the Yeah, so the negation of the disjunction is the same as the conjunction of the negations. If that's not a helpful way for you to remember it, then don't worry about it. If you do find that helpful, well, that's, that's a good way to memorize it. All right, so now that we have that, uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about the other way 
of showing things are logical, uh, logically equivalent. So the second method to show that two propositions are logically equivalent Uh, is to use a series of known logic, uh, logical equivalences, so equivalences that we've already established, to go from one proposition to the other. So we want to use a series of known logical equivalences that we know to be true, and I'll give you those in a second. Uh, and what we want to do is to go from one proposition to the other. Right, so it's just like if you had two algebraic expressions and you wanted to show that they were equal. Well, what you would do is you would start at one of them, do a bunch of simplification, and, and hopefully arrive at the other one. And if you can do that, then they're equal. Well, the same thing works for propositions. Uh, except you conclude that they're logically equivalent. All right. So I'm going to give you a bunch of these rules. Um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, so it will take a second or two to write these down. Uh, and these are what you can use as valid steps. Right? So if you were th uh, thinking about simplifying mathematical expressions, uh, if you had a plus one and a minus one, well, you could cancel them. And that's a rule that we know. Right? This is the same kind of things, except instead of working with addition, we're going to work with conjunction, disjunction, implication, and so on. All right, so let's get to listing these. There's something called the identity law. Uh, and it says, if you have a proposition P, and you, neg uh, and you uh, take the conjunction of that proposition and the value true, so I'm going to use capital T to represent true and capital F to represent false, well, if you do that, you get exactly whatever the value of P is. So P and true is always P. Right? And that, that sort of makes sense. And if you sat down and did a truth table, you could see that this really is correct. Right? The conjunction is only true if both of the conjuncts are true. And I'm telling you that this conjunct here is definitely true. So really, all you need to know is the value of P. If P is true, then the whole thing is true. If P is false, then the whole thing is false. So the value of the thing is just the value of P. So that's one of the identity laws. The other identity law is that P or false is also equal to P. Right? If you take the disjunction of two things, well, it's true when at least one of them is true. I'm telling you for sure that the second one is false, so the truth value is exactly the same as the truth value of the first thing. Right? That's, that's all the identity law says there. So there's two identity laws. There's one for conjunction and one for disjunction. Okay, we have another law, the idempotent law. All right, and it says, uh, again, two things. It says that if you take the disjunction of P with itself, you just get back P. And similarly, if you take the conjunction of P with itself, you just get back P. All right, so taking the disjunction or conjunction uh, with yourself doesn't do anything, really. You just get back exactly what you had before. Uh, the next set of laws are the domination laws. And again, it comes in two parts. P or true is automatically true. Doesn't matter what P is. And similarly, P and false is automatically false. It doesn't matter what P is. Right? Because conjunction means, uh, needs at least one of the uh, disjunctions, sorry, needs at least one of the disjuncts to be true. And this one right here is. So we know for sure that the whole thing is true without even checking the other one. And it's just the opposite for conjunction. We know if it is going to be true, both of them have to be true. Well, this one right here is not true, so we can stop and we know the whole thing is false. Question? Can you uh, say what you wrote the second law? What's the name of the second law? It's the idempotent law. I-D-E-M, potent. Other, yeah? 
Yep. No, no, De Morgan's law is this exact equivalence. It's not P or Q is equivalent to not P and not Q. So it's false, 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 true. That's De Morgan's law? No, so De Morgan's law is the statement that not P or Q, whoops, sorry, not P or Q is logically equivalent to not P and not Q. Oh. That right there is De Morgan. I'll list it in the table in a second. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. All right, so continuing on after the domination law, we have the negation law. The negation law says that P or not P has to be true. And it also says that P and not P has to be false. Right? And that makes sense. It's a, the disjunction is true if at least one of them is true. Well, one of P and not P, one of those has to be true. Right, for sure. So those are your only two choices, and the negation flips the truth value. So one of them has to be true. Uh, and similarly, P and not P, well, if one of them has to be true, the other one has to be false. And that means at least one of them is false, so that means that it is false. Question? Um, can you just explain the identity law one more time? Yeah, so the identity law says, uh, for a conjunction, it says P and true is logically equivalent to P. So remember, for conjunction, it's going to be true when they're both true, when both things are true, right? And in this example, I'm telling you that the second thing is true. So that means the whole thing is going to be true exactly when the first thing is true. We don't care about the second variable. And it's kind of the opposite of that for the or version. All right, so after the negation law comes something we're all usually familiar with, and that's the double negation law. And that, uh, that is that the negation of the negation of P is exactly the same as P. If you negate something twice, then you haven't done anything. That's double negation. We also have the commutative law. Uh, the commutative law says that for ors and ands on their own, you can rearrange them in whatever order you'd like but only within a single or or and. So that means that P or Q is exactly the same thing as Q or P. And similarly, P and Q is exactly the same thing as Q and P. All right, this is how like one plus three equals three plus one. All right, it doesn't matter the order you do it in. We have the same rule here, that's called the commutative law. Next we have the associative law. And this basically says if you have three things and it's both ors or both ands, then you can bracket it however you would like. So this is like one plus two plus three where the one and two are bracketed is the same as when the two and three are bracketed. All right, so the associative law says that P or Q or R is exactly the same thing as P or Q or R. Right? And that's why if you've seen examples where it's the and of three things, we don't really have to put brackets there because it doesn't matter where you put them. But that's only true when it's all ors or all ands. Uh, and we have a similar, tr uh, uh, similar rule for ands. So P and Q and R is exactly the same thing as P and Q and R. Those are the associative laws. Is that okay? Yeah? No, so these laws I'm giving to you and you can use them to prove other laws. So other logical equivalences. There was another question there? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going to do a law that covers that case right now. Other questions? All right, so we'll move on, on to this case where there's a mixture. In that case, we have the, what's called the distributive law. And again, this has two parts. Uh, P or Q and R, when you bracket it like this, 
Okay, so the P or and then Q and R all together. That's exactly the same as P or Q and P or R. So notice what you're doing. You're distributing the P to both the Q and the R. So this is exactly like if you were doing regular arithmetic math and you had something like 5 times A plus B. Right? That's 5 times A plus 5 times B. Exact same rule, uh, or exact same kind of rule uh, happens here. And notice what's going on. I know I can apply this rule because these uh, do not match. We have an or and an and. If we had two ors, well, we'd be up here in the associative case. Or if we had two ands, we'd be in the associative case. You can also switch these symbols. So the other version of the distributive law is P and Q or R is exactly the same thing as P and Q or P and R. Okay, so it's important to keep these symbols straight. It's really easy to confuse where it goes. The way I like to remember is if I have P or on the outside, well, I still have P or Q on this side. And I have P and Q in order there, so I have P and Q in order there. That's how I like to remember it, but you can maybe come up with something different if you like. All right, that's the distributive law. Moving on, we have the absorption law. All right, so the absorption law is this. If we have P or P and Q, that's exactly the same thing as P. And if we have P and P or Q, that's the exact same thing as P. Okay. Why are these true? Where are these coming from? Does anyone see? Because either way you get a P, how do, how do you see that though? Where's that coming from? Yeah? Yeah, so what you do basically is apply the distributive law to these things and see what happens. Right? If you don't believe the absorption laws are true, well, this is an or on the outside and and on the inside, so you can apply the distributive law to it. Do that and see what happens. All right, moving on, we'll do one that we've seen before. This is De Morgan's Law. So De Morgan's Law, again, says two things. The negation of P and Q is exactly the same thing as the negation of P or the negation of Q. But it works the other way, too. So the negation of P or Q is logically equivalent to the negation of P and the negation of Q. So notice what you're doing. You're essentially distributing a negation. That's really what De Morgan's Law says. And when you distribute a negation, you negate both of the things inside the parentheses and you switch the sign. So if, or switch the connective, I should say. If it was an and before, it becomes an or and vice versa. This is De Morgan's Law. Does that make sense? So if it's an implication, you need to get rid of the implication first. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that uh, right now. So implications are really just disjunctions in disguise. So implication equivalence is the, uh, one of the last rules we'll need. And this says that P implies Q is exactly the same as not P or Q, where the negation just applies to the P. So notice that all of the rules I've listed here, except this very last one, implication equivalence, uh, none of them deal with implication. It's all ands, ors, and nots. So that tells you when you're working with these things, the first thing you do uh, is get rid of implications, because we don't really have any rules that apply to them. So to get rid of them, you just apply this rule, uh, and then you can carry on with the other rules. Yeah? Yeah, so the PDFs will be available online. This exact list is also in your textbook. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, are we expected to remember what these rules are called? Or are they okay if we just remember what they are? So definitely you need to know what they are because 
what will happen is on a test, I will give you two, lo uh, two propositions and ask if they're logically equivalent. Uh, so you need to know what they are. I strongly suggest you learn what their names are. And the reason for that is this. If you are answering a test question and you're doing these chains of logical equivalences and you make a mistake somewhere, it is very challenging as a teaching assistant, and I've TA'd this course many, many times, uh, it's challenging to figure out what went wrong in your logic, okay? So I don't know when I'm marking your stuff if you basically know the rules but accidentally switched an and or an or, or if you have no idea what's going on. But if you say the names of the rules beside what you're doing, then I know that you basically had it, you knew what rule to apply, you just accidentally flipped an and or an or. So that's why I really like it when students write the names of rules. It makes it easier for us to give you marks, right? And that's something we both want, right? I don't want to take marks away. I'm forced to take marks away. By writing what your train of thought is, what your thought process is, we're more able to give you those marks. And the other side of that is, as you do many, many examples of these, you sort of won't be able to help but know the names. Right? I didn't sit down one day and say, say to myself, John, we're going to memorize the names of all the logical equivalences. That never happened. I just did tons and tons of examples, and now I know them. Okay? So the very last one that we need is called the biconditional equivalence, because we don't have anything that deals with if and only if. And again, the trick there is to just get rid of it. Okay? So P if and only if Q is exactly equal, or logically equivalent to P implies Q and Q implies P. So if you have a biconditional in, uh, in your proposition, first you get uh, rid of it by changing it into two implications, and then presumably you would get rid of the implications by going to implication equivalence. That's what I would suggest doing. That's the usual pattern that you'll follow. So in fact, any logical equivalence could be used, uh, but you would have to prove it before you used it. I'm giving you these ones for free, so you can always use these ones. Yeah? Yeah, so what you'd get is not P or Q and not Q or P. That will be your next step usually. The other thing you should notice is that every law here applies if P is a compound proposition or Q is a compound proposition uh, or R is a compound proposition. These all apply to blocks, if you like. It doesn't have to be a single letter. All right, so let's do some examples with this. So here's one. I have not P or not P and Q and not P and not Q. And I want to know, are these the same? Okay, that's the question I'm asking myself. So what I could do is a truth table. I could make a truth table for this thing, and if the columns for each one match, then I know they're logically equivalent. But we already know how to do that, so I'm going to do it a different way. So the way you attack these is you start on one side, and you apply a bunch of these laws and you hope to end up on the other side. So I'm going to start on one side. And typically you start on the side that's longer because the longer it is, the more stuff you can do to it. The first thing you should do is get rid of any if and only ifs. In this example, there are none. The second thing you should do is get rid of any implications. And in this example, there are none. The third thing you should do is apply De Morgan's Law as much as you can. And your goal when you apply De Morgan's Law is to move the negations as close to the atomic propositions, the letters, as you can. You want negations to apply to as little as possible. Right? This negation here applies to a lot. It applies to the whole thing. So I should use De Morgan's Law to move it in. So I do that, and I get not P and not not P and Q. Right? That's the very first step. 
Does that make sense to everyone? And what I like to do is write what I did. So I did De Morgan's Law. So far, so good? All right. Uh, now I continue on and write another thing that this is logically equivalent to. I go back to my list of rules. First, I get rid of the biconditionals. Then I get rid of the implications. And then I do De Morgan's Law. I can still do another De Morgan's Law because this negation here applies to a whole conjunction. And I don't want it to apply to a con conjunction. I want it to apply to a single variable whenever I can. So this stuff out here stays the same. And over here, I get not not P or not Q. So remember, I put the negation here and here, and then I uh, flip the symbol. Right? If it's a conjunction, it becomes a disjunction. If it's a disjunction, it becomes a conjunction. So this is what I get down here. And again, this is by De Morgan's Law. So far, so good? All right. So now I look at this and I say, oh, I have two negations in a row here. And I know that I can get rid of those. So I say not P and P or not Q. And that's by double negation. OK. This is OK so far? Yeah. Yes, so as you get more comfortable with this, you can definitely do two steps at a time. That's, that's OK. I would especially do that for uh, whenever I apply double negation. That usually doesn't need to be its own step. The more you do at the same time, the easier it is to make a mistake. And what's more, the harder it is for the TA to know where that mistake is if you're doing three steps in a row. So double negation, for sure, you can do that in, in one step. That's, that's fine. I wouldn't apply De Morgan's Law twice in one step if you can help it. Uh, because it, it really does make it easier for the TAs to see where things went wrong if they do. Uh, other questions? OK, so what do I do next? What does this look like? So I can apply associative because I have an and here and an or here. And associative only works when they match. What do I do when they don't match? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you do distributive when it's an and and an or, or an or and an and. So what we have is not P and P or not P and not Q. Or, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's good. Does this make sense? Any issues here? Okay, this is by the distributive law. Distributive. All right, what can we do next? Yeah, so if you don't remember what it is, we're still learning, and it is the negation law. I strongly suggest you do these questions next to this list, at least while you're learning to do them. So the negation law is, in fact, what tells us that that's false. So we have false or not P and not Q, and that's by the negation law. And what can we do next? Notice that we're kind of close to our answer, right? We want not P and not Q, and there's a not P and not Q sitting right there. How do we finish the job? Yeah, we just get rid of the false, and how do we do that? Yeah, that's the identity law. If you look into the uh, list of laws, that is exactly the identity law. So we'll go up here. The identity law says that something or false is just that something. And this is something or false. If you wanted to be completely technically correct and follow the rules exactly, you would do a commutative law first. But I think we can all agree that that's, that's not really necessary here. All right, so notice what happened. 
we have this proposition is logically equivalent to this proposition. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. That was the point of this question. So notice what happened uh, in terms of the amount of work we did as well. Uh, this is probably more work than doing a truth table, right? Because this only has two variables, P and Q. So the truth table would only have four rows. So that's, that's not too bad. Where logical equivalences shine uh, is when you have longer, more complex uh, propositions. Sometimes you can find a much shorter proof uh, of logical equivalence using this technique than using a truth table. Right? If you've been doing sample problems, you know that sometimes truth tables can get kind of large and messy. That's what this avoids. You can also look at it this way. If you're going to do a truth table, that's somehow a, a, a fixed amount of work basically regardless of what the truth table is. Right? If I gave you some proposition and you're really comfortable with making truth tables and the proposition has eight rows, uh, three variables for a total of eight rows in the truth table, it's going to take you about the same amount of work no matter what the proposition is, right? It's not going to be drastically different given that it's about the same length. Uh, so that's always going to take you roughly a fixed amount of time on a test. For logical equivalences, if you're really good at them, you've done a lot of practice and you can see right away what to apply next, you can sometimes do these much more quickly than you can a truth table question. But if you aren't that familiar with them and you're not that good at them, or for whatever reason you just don't see what to do next, it can take you much longer to do it this way. Yeah? Yes, so that's, that's the other danger, is when I, I won't always give you two things that are equivalent. I might ask you to decide if these two things are equivalent. And sometimes this can be difficult to see using logical equivalences because you don't know if they're not logically equivalent and it's impossible to prove that they are because they're not, or if maybe they are logically equivalent but you just can't see the rules to apply. So we'll see some examples uh, where they're not logically equivalent and you can deal with that but it is a little bit harder to see. All right, so this technique actually also works if we want to talk about tautology, contradiction, contingency. And the reason it works this way uh, is because something's a tautology if it's logically equivalent to true. And something's a contradiction if it's logically equivalent to false. Right? That's really all it is, right? That's the same as checking to see if the column is all trues. Well, if the proposition is true, that column is all trues, right? It doesn't matter what the values of the variables are. So as an example, we could ask ourselves, is P and Q implies P or Q a tautology? And it's not too hard to see that the answer is going to be yes. Uh, but if we wanted to actually sit down and do it, we would start with the expression and we would apply logical equivalences to it. So remember the first things you want to do are get rid of if and only if uh, an implication. This has an implication, so we'll get rid of it. We get not P and Q or P or Q. Right, that's the first thing you do, and that's by implication equivalence. I'm just going to write this in short, so IMPL EQV. All right, so then the next thing you want to do is say, oh, there's a negation here, and it applies to a conjunction uh, and I don't want that. I only want my negation to apply to variables. So I should get rid of that next. And I can do that using De Morgan's Law. So that's not P or not Q. And then I still have this P or Q over here. That's by De Morgan's. 
And I can pr uh, bracket it like this. Although, notice now that those are all ORs, so it doesn't really matter how I bracket it. And as a result of that, I can actually rearrange this to be P or not P, or Q or not Q. And that's by using the associative laws and the commutative laws. This, I would say, is the only time, other than maybe double negation, where you should definitely use multiple rules in one step. Right? Obviously, uh, because of the commutative laws, I could put them in any order I like because they're all ORs. Even though the commutative law says you can switch things one at a time, you can really switch them as many times as you would like. So in, in this particular case, uh, definitely don't break this into three steps. That would be uh, a little too verbose. All right, so now we have P or not P, and I know that that's true, and that's by the negation law. And we have Q or not Q, and that's also true by the negation law. So really this is the negation law twice. Uh, and now I have true or something, and that's true by the domination law. So this original logically, uh, this original proposition, sorry, is logically equivalent to true, which means it's a tautology. All right. Uh, you might have noticed that at this step here, the second from the last step, I actually don't need to apply negation to this part, right? As soon as one part of the or is true, then I, I'm done and I can apply the domination law. I don't need to do that extra step. Although it's not wrong if you do it. So any questions about how this proof went? Yep. Um, with the Morgan law step, could you factor out the not and then use the negation law? Uh, factor out which, sorry? Factor out the not. Here? So if you factor out the not, you, you end up back with this, right? By factoring out the negation, you also have to sw uh, flip the connective. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so associative just says that you can bracket it however you would like. So if you have P or Q or R, you can put the brackets around the first two or the last two. doesn't matter. And similarly for AND, but the important thing is that they're both the same. Uh, and the distributive law, you asked about the distributive law? Oh, the commutative law, sorry. Yeah, so associative says you can bracket it however you want. Commutative says you can order it however you want. So P or Q is one, Q or P is the other. The important thing is that the connectors are the same. Right? If I had an or and an and, then I can't apply these laws. I'd have to apply the distributive law. Okay. Other questions? Yep. Uh, which? So th this line here? Right. Yeah, so there you don't need brackets because they're all the same uh, connective. The only time you need the parentheses is when you have multiple connectives. Yeah? Right, so the way you tell it's a contingency is if you get down to something that you know for sure you could make true or false. So what will happen is you'll simplify it down to P, say. And at that point, you say to yourself, oh, well, P could definitely be true or false. It depends on the value of P. Right? That's, that's clearly uh, the case. Uh, so the idea is you simplify it enough to the point where you say, yeah, that could definitely be true or false depending on the values. And as you do more and more of these, you'll get a feel for when that's the case. But I would say that is, that is the weakness of applying this method to deciding it's a contingency, is it's hard to see that until you've done a lot of, uh, a lot of examples. All right, let's, let's see another one. Uh, let's go back to logical equivalences for the time being. I want to know about P implies Q implies R and P implies Q implies R. 
That's what I'd like to know about. So are these the same? So really this is saying, does the associative law apply to implications? So can you bracket implications however you would like? Um, so just out of curiosity, uh, is this valid or no? What do people think? No. No? So who says no? Who says yes? So a lot of you say neither is the message I'm, I'm getting, which is kind of weird, but okay. All right, so we could do this uh, a couple of ways. Uh, one way is to use a truth table. So let's, let's go ahead and do a truth table first. So we have P, Q, and R, and the things we need are P implies Q, Q implies R, and then we have P implies Q implies R, and P implies Q implies R. So I'm doing all the intermediate ones sort of together. You are free to do it this way if you would like. So true, 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 false, 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 false. True, true, false, false, true, true, false, false. And then true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. P implies Q is true, true, false, false, and then all trues. Q implies R is true, false, true, 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 false, true, true. Uh, and you should be comfortable doing it this quickly. And the reason I'm able to do it this quickly is because I always put my rows in the same order, right, based on the, uh, the values of the variables, right? Because once I get down to, for example, when I'm doing this first column here, once I get down to this, I know that P is always false from that point on, so I know that the implication is always true. I don't need to think about it every time. That's what makes me fast at doing this. That, and I've done a million of them. All right. So now I do P implies Q, which is this column, implies R. This is one of the ones you have to be careful on because the implication is going in a different direction than the columns are written. So I'm saying this implies this. So true implies true is true. True implies false is false. True, uh, false implies true is true. False implies false is true. True implies true is true. And then I have true implies false is false. True implies true is true. True implies false is false. Okay, everyone sees how I got that column? Okay, so now I do P over here, implies Q implies R, which is over here, and this is in the order that the columns appear. It's left to right. Yeah? I have uh, P implies Q is this, implies false. So true implies false is false. Oh, sorry. You're looking at P implies Q and R. Yeah, I'm looking at these two. Other questions? Yeah? Yeah, so this is true implies false, which is false. Right, I'm going this column here, P implies Q implies R. All right, so the next one, uh, I get true implies true, which is true. True implies, uh, implies false, which is false. True right here, whoops. True right here implies true, which is true. True implies true, which is true. And now at this point, the rest are gonna be true, right? Because P is always false. So true, 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 true. And look at what happens. These don't match and these don't match. Everything else does match, but that doesn't matter. All I need is one thing that mismatches. So these rows are not equal, and therefore they are not, the two propositions are not logically, whoops, not logically equivalent. Yep.
If you did, uh, so you simplify the left side a bit, simplify the right side a little bit. That's okay as long as you explain what you're doing. Yeah. All right. So let's see, let, let's see a little bit how to do this with laws. So we actually haven't talked about what it means for two expressions not to be logically equivalent. We've only talked about what it means for them to be logically equivalent. They're not logically equivalent if there exist truth settings such that when you plug the truth settings into one proposition, you get a different answer than when you plug them into the other proposition. Right? And that makes sense because that means if you go to the truth table, there's a truth setting, say this one right here, such that you get a different answer here than you do there. Right? That's, that's the same thing. All right, so the way you would do this is to say, take P to be Q to be R to be true. Right? Take everything to be true. Then P implies Q implies R is exactly the same thing as true implies true implies true is exactly, or sorry, I didn't mean true, I meant false. My mistake. False implies false implies false. So false implies false is true. So that whole thing is false. But if we do it the other way, P implies Q implies R, well then we get false implies False implies false, which is exactly the same thing as false implies true, which is exactly the same thing as true, and these two things are not equal. Okay? So that's how you do it without making a truth table. Now you might say to yourself, okay, that's great, but how did he know that they all should be set to false? I mean, don't you sort of have to make a truth table to figure that out? Uh, and the answer is yes, until you get a lot of experience, right? When you do a lot of these sample problems, you'll see that, oh, well, I can make this expression uh, false easily, and if I make this false, then the whole thing is true, so what do I have to do to P to make that happen? Is there some way I can make the opposite thing happen here? Now that might seem crazy to you now, but as you do more and more of these sample problems, you'll get fast at it. You'll be able to see these patterns. Okay? And by doing those patterns, you could save yourself a lot of time on a test or an exam. Right? And time is valuable on these things because they're just 45 minutes long. Uh, well, the exam is obviously longer. Um, so notice that this thing up here, making this truth table, that took a fair bit of work. But if I was able to see this, that's three lines of work. That's super fast, right? I basically just need to evaluate uh, two propositions. So that's why this is nice. That's why you should always try to think of things this way, uh, if possible. All right, so let's do, uh, let's do one more example. And this sort of ties everything together. This says, are the statements If food is good, then it is not cheap. And if food is cheap, then it is not good. Uh, are those two statements saying the same thing? Right? This is how you would get asked the question informally, but because you've taken Comp 1805, you know that what the speaker is really asking is, are they logically equivalent? Okay. So who thinks they're logically equivalent? And who thinks they're not logically equivalent? And who thinks they're neither equivalent nor not equivalent? Okay, so, yeah, that's, that's weird. Okay. So, uh, the way you can approach this is to either make a truth table, uh, which is fine, uh, or you can do logical equivalences. And we're going to do logical equivalences. Uh, note, however, that you haven't been given any propositions here. So the first thing you really need to do is translate those statements into logic. Right? So I'm going to say, let G be uh, food is good. 
and really that means the food is good, and C mean the food is cheap. Okay. Once we've done that, uh, how do we translate the first statement? If food is good, then it is not cheap. Yeah? So G implies C, not C. So G implies not C. And the other one? C implies not G. Those are the two statements. Another way this could be phrased is slightly different and possibly confusing. So the first statement, you could say, good food is not cheap. Good food is not cheap. Is that a valid translation of the first statement? Why would that be a valid translation of the first statement? So the issue is you have to think about what the speaker is saying. And this is where English becomes really ambiguous. I would argue that good food is not cheap. You could view as being logically equivalent to that first statement. Okay, but that's really weird because that also sounds like it's its own proposition that you could look at in isolation. Because it really only expresses one fact in some sense, but in another sense it expresses two facts. So this is something you need to be aware of when you're doing translations. I wouldn't give you the ambiguous phrasing on a test or something. Yeah? Uh, they are, and so they, they do end up being equivalent. All right, so let's, let's, let's do it for real though. Uh, so we want to go from one to the other. So we have G implies not C. The first thing you should always do is implication equivalence. So we get not G or not C by implication equivalence. And then we can rearrange this to get not C or not G. And that's by the commutative law. And then we get C implies not G. And that's by implication equivalence, but in reverse. Right? All of the rules I gave you also apply in the other direction. So that's, that's important to be aware of. And then notice that this thing here is exactly that. So they're logically equivalent. Now your observation that they were contrapositives of each other is great. That's really important to recognize but at the same time, there isn't a contrapositive rule that we can just appeal to. So, in a case like this, if you notice that they are contrapositives of each other, you should say to yourself, oh, there's probably a pretty straightforward logical equivalence proof. I shouldn't go through the trouble of making a truth table for this question. Right? That's, that's what I would say, given my experience. And now you've observed this fact, so that is maybe helpful for you as well. Okay. All right, so that's everything I want to say about propositional logic. Any questions? Yes? Yes, it is, for sure, but that's not on the list. So if you wanted to use that, you would need to do a little proof at the beginning. Other questions? All right, so let's move on to the next topic in this course, which is still about logic, and it's the idea of predicate logic. All right, so there's, there's some problems with propositional logic. So the logic I talked about for the last two lectures. And I'll illustrate that problem with the following. How does one say, Everyone in this class is a student. How do you say that in propositional logic? So, I mean, you could say just that. Everyone in this class is a student is a proposition. And because it's a declarative sentence, it's either true or false. Uh, but I said that kind of thing wasn't useful because while it is a proposition, it is a declarative sentence, it doesn't say just one fact. 
right? It says a lot of facts. It says that each one of you is a student. So the statement, everyone is in this class is a student, is really 350 statements, if you think about it, or however many of you there are. So we need something else. Is there another way we could express this? Yeah? Right, so that's, that's a better way of saying it, uh, because now we're talking about reasons why things are the way that they are, which is nice. Um, okay, unfortunately, we still have this thing of everyone, and that somehow obscures away a lot of detail. It's an important fact that everyone in this class is a student, and I want to state those facts about each student individually, right? I want to say you're a student, and you're a student, and you're a student, and you're a student, and you're a student. Uh, and not just that, I also want to say you're in this class, and you're in this class, and you're in this class, and you're in this class. So let's, let's think about this for a little bit. The first thing that we all agree on is that it's not useful on its own as a proposition. It's not useful on its own because it says too much. Right? It's somehow a very broad statement that applies to a lot. Uh, we'd like to state smaller facts because propositions should talk about one thing. So something like person X is a student, where X is one of your names, say. Uh, and not just that, but we also want person X is in this class. Because really there's two things going on in that sentence, right? There's so, uh, something about being in this class and there's something about being a student. There's two kinds of facts. So we need to express those facts in different ways. So what we could do is say something like, so I'm going to name you in a very personal way, your X1, your X2, your X3, your X4, your X5, and so on. So I could say, uh, X1 is in this class, and X1 is a student, and X2 is in this class, and X2 is a student. Bear with me, this will take a second. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I won't do the whole thing. So that's okay. Uh, I have two propositions for every person in the room, uh, and I just take the conjunction of all of them. Yeah? Yeah, so it feels like th what we're saying is I want to apply some proposition to an entire set. Right? I don't want to write out the individuals in that set every time. I just want to say, you know what, there's a set of people, and this is some fa these are some facts about that set. That's, that's what I'd like to be able to do. And in fact, that's exactly the approach we'll take. So what we have doing it the bad way, this way, is two propositions per person. So yes, you can do it that way, but it's a lot of work. It's a lot of writing. It'd be nice if there were some kind of shorthand. So there's a couple of things that we do. The first idea we have is that being a student and being in this class are examples of properties that people can have. So that's the first observation. The second observation 
is who has these properties? Well, the sentence says that everyone has these properties. So everyone quantifies uh, which people have the property. All right, so we're going to deal with these things separately. First, I want to deal with the idea of properties, and then I want to deal with the idea of quantification of those properties. So we can define things called propositional functions. And what they do is that they assert that a predicate is true about some object. All right, so by way of example, let's say S denotes the predicate is a student. That's a predicate. Well, then SX is a propositional function that denotes X is a student. And this function takes, say, one of your names as a parameter, and it gives back a truth value that depends on whether or not that person is, in fact, a student. OK? And this works for all predicates, right? You can define predicates that says uh, is shorter than, is greater than, if you're talking about numbers, is a boat, if you're talking about objects, whatever you want. Right? It, it doesn't matter. And once you've defined that proposition, every object you give it, so in this example, x, well, that will define or produce a truth value. So as an example, if Px is, means uh, x is greater than 3, and now we put in numbers as the objects, and I'll talk about what kind of objects you're allowed to put in a little bit later. Um, we, these are really just the propositions we've already dealt with in disguise. So P2 means 2 is greater than 3 which is false. P3 means 3 is greater than 3, which is false. P4 means 4 is greater than 3, which is true. And so on. Okay? You don't have to stop at one variable either. You could have PXY. So if PXY means x is greater than y, you, uh, you could have something like p12, and that would be false, because 1 is not greater than y, but p21 would be true, because 2 is greater than 1. Question? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, Let's talk about that now. We have this thing called the universe of discourse. And the universe of discourse is the set of all things in your particular application that makes sense to put, in, uh, to put into this uh, propositional function. Okay? So in the, in the first example I did about students, 
right? Everyone in this class is a student. I defined a predicate S, which means S is a student. The only thing that makes sense to put into that function uh, is something from the set of people, right? Only people can be students, let's say. All right, so that's the universe of discourse. It's the set of things that we can draw our objects from and put into uh, the propositional functions that we define. Okay? So, as an example, if Px means x is greater than 3, just like it did before, the universe of discourse which is usually abbreviated U of D, uh, it's the set of all real numbers, say. Right? You could say it's the set of integers if you wanted to. That's fine. The important thing is that you specify it. So on most questions, I will specify it for you. If I don't specify it, it means you have to tell me what it is. Question? So when we're defining the propositional functions, it should be like a single fact, but later we'll see how to combine them just like we did before. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah. So the objects are the things that you give to the propositional function. So it's the argument or parameter, if you want to think like a, like a programmer. So, for example, if I had the propositional function x is greater than 3, x is the object I'm putting in there. It stands for it. And then when I actually put something in, like 5, that is the object I'm talking about. And that 5 is the thing that gets drawn from the universe of discourse. So in this case, 5 is a real number, so it's valid. Okay? So it's important to define the universe of discourse. Otherwise, as you said, you could get something like John is greater than 3, which doesn't make sense. Although I am. <laughs> All right, so it's important to define a universe of discourse. So it's the set of all values. or sometimes, depending on the context, that might mean names, you can plug into the propositional functions. And usually you have to define one for each question in this course. That's usually what you have to do. All right, so if we think back uh, to the example that motivated this, everyone in this room is a class, uh, everyone in this classroom is a student, uh, what we've done by defining propositional functions is given us shorthand for the predicates uh, is in this class and is a student. But we haven't really tackled that last thing yet, and that's the idea of everyone, right? We haven't said how these things are quantified. So the first kind of quantification I want to talk about is universal quantification. Okay. So given a propositional function, we can quantify it using a universal quantifier to mean something special. So given a propositional function, let's say px, the universe, whoops, the universal quantification uh, of that propositional function is the following proposition. Px is true 
for all values x in the universe of discourse. That's what the universal quantification is. And we write that the following way. For all x, px. So that is an upside down capital A. I guess we ran it as symbols. Uh, and then an x. And x means what object am I going to use to put in. And then px, which is the propositional function. So for all, and then the parameter to the function, and then the function. That's, that's what you would do. You could just as easily write for all y, p, y. That's fine. It doesn't matter what letter you use, only that it's consistent. You might think it's redundant to put it both times, but as we'll see, you can quantify multiple statements in the same proposition, and then this ambiguity uh, goes away. Uh, uh, the, sorry, the ambiguity arises, the redundancy goes away. All right, so this notation is essentially just shorthand, more or less. So what is it shorthand for? Well, for all x, px is basically equivalent to px1 and px2 and px3 and so on, where the universe of discourse is the set x1, x2, x3, and so on. Okay. Of course, if your universe of discourse is infinitely big, let's say your universe of discourse is a set of real numbers, like it was in the other example, well, then it's not really shorthand because the full longhand way of writing it out is infinitely long. So I wouldn't really consider it shorthand in that case because there's no alternative. Okay? So does everyone see that Px is true for all values x in the universe of discourse is exactly the same as this statement here? Does everyone believe and accept that? Seems natural. All right. So... Uh, one thing you should notice is that since px, or since for all x, px is essentially a conjunction, right, it's just a very large number of conjunctions, possibly an infinite number of conjunctions, um, it must be the case that it has truth value true exactly when the predicate is true for all objects in the years of discourse, uh, but false otherwise. So I'll, I'll, I'll write that out in English, actually. Precisely when the predicate is true for all objects in the universe of discourse, and false otherwise. So that's all there is to universal quantification. And if you get confused by it, come back to this exact paragraph right there. That is how you get around the problem you're probably having. Yeah? Did you call it a so at that point, so tautologies make sense when you talk about an entire proposition. Uh, if your proposition was for all x, px, well, that's, that's something slightly different, right? Because I haven't said what those truth values are. I'm just saying this is a proposition. It could be true, it could be false, right? So for, to, to talk about tautologies, you need actual settings for those truth values. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's, the universe of discourse is where x comes from. x is drawn out of some set. right? So if uh, px means x is greater than 3, well, x is the object I'm talking about, and it's drawn from the set of real numbers, or maybe the set of integers, the question would tell you. Other questions? 
All right. So uh, because of this, we also know that the uh, universal quantification will be false if the predicate is false for at least one object in the universe of discourse. So for at least one object in the universe of discourse, discourse, then for all x, px is false. All right. So let's do uh, a couple quick examples. So if px means x is greater than 5, and the universe of discourse is the set of integers, what is the truth value of for all x, px? False. So why is it false? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So whenever you want to show that a universally quantified statement is false, the easiest way to do that is show one thing from the universe of discourse that when you plug it into the propositional function, it gives you back the value false. So this statement is, whoops, is false because P4 is false. Right? It's true that P3 is false, P2 is false, P1 is false, P0 is false, P minus 1 is false, and so on. But I only need one example. Right? One example uh, does the job. Now, if your universe of discourse was the set of integers greater than or equal to 6, then what happens? Then it's true. Uh, that's kind of a weird universe of discourse, but it's a perfectly valid one. If that's what the question says, then that's what it is. All right, here's another one. If P of X is the statement X squared is greater than or equal to X, and the universe of discourse is the set of real numbers, uh, is for all X, P, X true? False, who says true? Who says false? Okay. Um, okay. Someone who thinks it's true. Uh, explain why. Yeah. Okay. Uh, someone who says it's false. Explain why. You. Yeah, so the key thing here is that it's real numbers. That's, that's important, okay? So I'll defer the answer, and I'll just say that x squared is bigger than x is exactly the same thing as x squared minus x is bigger than or equal to 0, right? And that's exactly the same thing as x times x minus 1 is bigger than or equal to 0. And that is exactly true if x is less than or equal to 0 or x is greater than or equal to 1. Those are the conditions, I guess it's redundant to say if. Those are the conditions under which that statement is true. Therefore, because I am in the real numbers, this thing is false. And I can just take x to be equal to, as you suggested, 0 0.1. If the universe of discourse were the set of integers, however, the only way I could have this be false is if I gave it an integer that was strictly between 0 and 1. And is there any such integer? No, right? So if the universe of discourse were integers, it would be true. 
So this shows you that the universe of discourse really does matter, right? This isn't one of those things where, like, John is greater than three. That, that clearly doesn't make sense. But in this example, both universes of discourse are valid, but one of them, it's true, the other, it's false. So this is why you always have to specify. All right, so that's it for today, guys. Uh, we'll see you next time.